All right. Howdy, everybody. So we are here to talk today about the Renaissance. We have this class. We have a class next week. The following week is your presentation. So please, if you have not talked to me about a topic, make sure you do that. We have moved now through the Middle Ages, that period of time where the church reigned. <coughs> a lot of the art from that period of time had to do with how naughty we were as Christians, so reminding us that we were all sinners, we were born with this original sin, and that it was our job to fight like hell, to do the right thing, to get into heaven. We are coming into this new period of time called the Renaissance. This is where our very well-known artists, our Ninja Turtles, are all going to be in. So Raphael, Leonardo, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Donatello. And there is a shift in, in thinking and a shift in the human experience. Part of this has to do with we've had this very stable period of the high Middle Ages, and we begin to form a middle class. That middle class has a little bit of time for leisure, a little bit of expendable income to spend, and we do see a new world of and class of art emerging. Class of art, this idea that art can just be enjoyed. Art doesn't have to be something that is a dumpy portrait meant to be um, to commemorate great uncle Vincent, but art that is meant to be observed, thought of as beautiful, this period of time is characterized largely by a resurgence, a remembering of the ideas of the ancient world. So the Greeks and the Romans, we talk about the ancient world, this classical world. These people were living in the ruins of the ancient world. So think about the Colosseum, people living in Rome. If you're walking around Rome, you're seeing the Pantheon, you're seeing the Arch of Triumph. You are seeing the Colosseum. You are experiencing walking on the Roman cobblestones anywhere in, in Europe. But the ideas, the philosophy, the story literally means rebirth. And you can think of that as a resurgence of these ideas. Another key component, a core element, is that shift from we are broken and messed up as humans to this idea that we are born perfect, that God doesn't think we're broken, that we are innately wonderful with gifts to bring. And that idea is, is very new, and we talk about that as a humanist idea of humanism. We'll talk a little bit later in our lecture about Renaissance men. And that idea, this concept of being able to do many unrelated things, that harkens back to who from the ancient world. We talk about the ancient scholars. What are some of the men from the ancient world that were like that? Who do we have? What's that? Who are our lineage of philosophers? Who were they? Yeah, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, right? Alexander the Great. So these minds that were able to connect things like botany with things like uh, astronomy and um, uh, mathematical algorithms and bring all these ideas together, we have a resurgence of thinkers that think along those lines during this period of time. Remember this here, the Laocoon group? <clears throat> So this was something, there was this, this new idea, this, this new way of thinking, which was there were important pieces of history, they were living amongst them, as I said, but they also were thinking about the history that was still stuck in the ground. So during the early Renaissance, we have the beginning of archaeology. We have the beginning of an interest in drawing things out of the ground, studying them, understanding them. Part of that was a passion for looking at the way the Greeks sculpted art. So the Middle Ages, when you think about, let's say, um, remember the, the two mosaics? We had the Empress Theodora and Emperor Justinian, um, and they were just kind of like floating in this golden space. There was no sense of, of gravity, of perspective, of how clothes actually folded on our bodies. 
The Greeks had mastered those things, and the Middle Ages had forgotten about them. So we see Renaissance artists looking back at these Greek statues in order to understand the human body, to understand how to form the human body. On the left-hand side, we have Donatello from 430, and on the right, we have Mary Magdalene from 455. We'll talk about the story of David a little bit later in class as well. Anybody know the story of David and Goliath? What's the story? With uh, David's a child and Goliath is a giant, and he goes out on the field and takes his little sort of shot and kills the giant. Yeah, so it's sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A Goliath was part of an invading army, and David was a shepherd boy. He was watching his, his brothers go off and fight this army every day, and this giant Goliath is just really destroying everyone that he was fighting against. And David, with his simple slingshot, kills Goliath. He brought five pebbles with him, kills Goliath, and then he does what? Does anybody know the next part of the story? What's he do? Yeah, he cuts his head off. <clears throat> so you can see here in this image, on the left, he's standing on Goliath's head, his helmet here, his bridge of his nose, and his beard. So take a minute, let's chat with your neighbor for a minute about this up here. Sorry, I have to introduce our Mary Magdalene. Who's Mary Magdalene? So we have Old Testament story, the story of David and Goliath, a New Testament story, story of Mary Magdalene. Who was she? Anybody know? So Christ had several apostles. We, we see them surrounding him at the Last Supper, the images of the Last Supper. We'll see one of those a little later. And Mary Magdalene was, was a follower of his. She was traditionally thought to have been a whore. And she was often thought about, talked about, and displayed, presenting that way. From modern history and modern readings of the Bible, <laughs> we don't necessarily think she was. But Donatella would have had that perspective. She was a woman that was found a bit degenerate by Christ and was supposed to have been elevated by him and her companionship with him. So what I'd like for you to do, chat with your neighbor for a few minutes. We have two statues. They're made by the same artist about 25 years apart. Very different subject matters. What are the differences? Do you, are you able to find any similarities? And most importantly, why do you show David one way and Mary the other? And I want you to also be thinking about the material that was used, the mediums here. So we have bronze for David on the left and wood for Mary Magdalene on the right. <laughs> The statues are pretty similar in size. The one on the left, I think, is like four feet two inches tall. She's slightly taller, four feet seven or four feet eight. She, what I just did, which looks like she's actually her hands, her portion of hands. Because I thought she looked a little sleeper. Maybe because she's uh, presented, maybe, maybe that's why, but you know, the original thing about it. The Greek? Yeah, so I was thinking why she's going to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
out of wood, David confident and chill out of bronze. What do you find you see Yeah. What do you mean? Status. Oh, status. So Mary as a uh, cast out woman. Yeah, and like a more common like material to work with, whereas bronze is probably like a little more expensive or refined. But it's gilded. It's wood and gilded. It is. So it has gold on it. So it's interesting. It's kind of that a bit of a dichotomy that way. All right. <clears throat> This image, raise your hand if you've never seen this image before. Never? Never. Just a handful of you. This is one of the more iconic images from the Renaissance. So let's get this down your notes. Birth of Venus by Botticelli from 1480. We have four characters here, all the way on the left in the god Zaffir. He is the god of wind. He's carrying his wife, who was always incredibly jealous. And his wife is kind of gazing over at the two other ladies. Zaffir is blowing our character in the middle. Our character in the middle is Venus, the goddess of love, of fertility, of childbirth. She is the characterization of passion and lust. All of our early figures that we study, those fertility figures, they were called Venus for a reason. So here's Venus in the middle. On the right hand side, ready to gather her, is this allegory, this personification of spring. So we have the world of the gods, these floating gods, the water, the ethereal water, she's being pushed over on the water and being gathered onto land, onto our world. So we're witnessing almost the, the bridge between these two worlds, the worlds that humans live in and the worlds that the gods live in. And she's being presented as a gift to our world. We start to, in the Renaissance, see these Greco-Roman stories come back. And that's important. These were stories, the narratives of the gods and goddesses had been squashed and forgotten. And we start to see them filtering back into the narrative and the imagery in, in art again. I mentioned that we were starting to also see a resurgence and an interest of studying the Greek art with the Aphrodite of Midos from the 4th century BC on the left, or Venus on the right, and it's undeniable that Botticelli would have been studying images like this. When we see how they are standing, how these two figures are postured. All right, so our next slide here, um, you do not need to copy down this whole middle section about Michelangelo and Leonardo, but the High Renaissance, what I do want you to have is this here, a Renaissance man is someone capable of doing many unrelated things. We have people like Michelangelo, who was a painter, sculptor, poet, and architect, Leonardo, a painter, inventor, sculptor, architect, engineer, scientist, and musician. And the most important piece of this is this bottom piece. They weren't just studying how things worked. They were interested in how things could work, that inventive mind. 
Leonardo da Vinci invented dozens of things that could not be brought manifest for years. The flying machine, the uh, like an underwater breathing apparatus for, di for diving that wouldn't be invented for another couple hundred years. The machine gun, the idea of this implement that would release bullet after bullet after bullet. He had drawings of the first robot, the first parachute, the first tank. Both Da Vinci and Michelangelo, Michelangelo to an even more extreme um, limit of this, were studying cadavers. They were studying the bodies of the dead. Michelangelo would, was robbing graves, outright robbing graves, in order to understand human form. So when we think about Greek artists and their mastery of human form, that was from looking at, studying. When we think about Renaissance artists and their master of human form, they were peering underneath the skin. They knew that muscles, sinew, bone poked out certain ways because of what was under the surface. That was a line that, to our knowledge, a lot of the Greek sculpture, sculptures wouldn't or couldn't cross. So that understanding of the body, the body systems, was incredibly developed by Renaissance artists. This image is called the Vitruvian Man. Here, this is from one of Leonardo's notebooks. Anybody know anything about how Leonardo wrote in his notebooks? What he did is kind of strange. He was left-handed. Anybody in here left-handed? No. So think about it. If you are, like, take your pen in your other hand for a minute, and if you are writing left-handed, you are going to constantly smudge your writing. Right? If you're writing as right-handed people, we are writing ahead of ourselves. Left-handed people are writing into their wet ink. So he began to write backwards, and he did something that they call mirror writing in his notebooks and his journals. Not only did he write from right to left, but his words were reversed. Everything he wrote was reversed. I mentioned in the last slide that they were interested in not only how things worked, but how things might work. And this journal entry is evidence of that. He was studying Vitruvius. He was a Greek philosopher. And um, Vitruvius was very, very interested in finding mathematical formulas that represented the world we lived in. So things like the golden ratio come out of that work. The idea that spiral of the golden ratio. Leonardo, you can see in this image, was overlaying a square and a circle and the human form and just trying to understand how it all fit together. He was using the mathematical proportions of Vitruvius in order to understand fully the human form. He was trying to create reason and put order to something that didn't really have reasonable order. He did quite a few anatomical drawings. As I mentioned, he was studying cadavers. And to this day, some of his drawings are some of the most easily labeled and accessible imagery of the inside of the human body. This image is kind of hard to look at because we can imagine that he only was able to draw this because there was a mother with a dead child inside of her didn't survive, and he was able to draw the uterine wall the way the baby is inside. These images and his notebooks, there's thousands of pages. We have existed to us today 7,000 pages of his notebooks, and we're certain there are more, because they're only in fragments. He wrote in loose leaf paper like this, and then would, once he had enough that he wanted to put them together, he would bind them together after the fact. 
This image here is, I think, one of the most interesting of Leonardo's paintings. This is Da Vinci, Madonna, and Child of St. Anne. There are two terms I want to introduce here. The first is this idea of sfumato. So sfumato, the word, translates as smoke. The idea that things are hazy, lines are blurred. We'll look at the Mona Lisa in the next slide, and you'll see that again. The other is a, almost a similar idea, this idea of atmospheric perspective. What is further away is kind of obfuscated by the haze of distance. The atmosphere itself has body to it. We're looking a long way through it. Things are going to become a little more obscure the further away they are. This is a lineage we are seeing on the right-hand side. We talked about the pyramids, the great pyramids. I said we had grandfather, father, son. This is the same. This is grandmother, mother, and child. So St. Anne is the Virgin Mary's grandmother. And then we have seated on her lap the Virgin Mary herself. And then trying to get away from Mary, trying to climb on this little lamb, a little sacrifice, we have the Christ child. I'll give you a minute to copy that down. I want you to also add in here that one of the things that Da Vinci did that was very different was he put a portrait in front of a landscape. So he's combining these two different ideas of painting, portrait and landscape photography, and putting them into a landscape painting. Putting, I just talked photography in my brain in two places. So we have painting and landscape in one image. dates down. We have a contemporary of Da Vinci, contemporary meaning somebody that was living during the time of Da Vinci, write about this painting. And the, the writings that have lasted, that have come down to us today about this painting that were observed during Leonardo's lifetime, during the time he was supposed to have painted this, are one of the reasons that we believe she's so significant or so famous. Never mind the fact that she was stolen in the 1911 theft, but also because we've always suspected there might be two copies of her. So the writings talked about her having a hat pin, having a brocade veil, there being columns right next to her head. So the idea, this mystery that there might be more than one Mona Lisa was something that really haunted artists and art historians through time. But we come to find out that video that we just watched, there's a wonderful documentary, it's a 55 minute or so long documentary, that what we find out about this image is that those columns that we see or heard about, that were written about, and the different headdress she was wearing that he wrote about, those are all layers underneath this painting. So he had done several incarnations of the same painting on the same
Here we see an example of that. So please get this one down in your notes. Da Vinci, The Last Supper from 1495. When we talk about Christian art, when we see Christian imagery, what do holy people almost always have floating around their heads? Halos. Halos. What is distinctly lacking? This is an image of the Last Supper. We talked a little bit about the, um, the stories, the narratives surrounding Christ leading to the scene. There were two things present at the table here. What, what are the two food items that are here at the table for the Last Supper? Bread and, and wine. And we see the lack of halo. Where is Christ seated? He's right in the middle, but he's at the table, right? He's right across from us at the table. He's not elevated on high. This idea, both with the Mona Lisa, even with this image, that the human, this is this idea of humanism, the human is worthy of being seen. The human is worthy of a portrait, of an image. One of the things I love about this painting is this character here. A lot of historians believe she might be Mary Magdalene, which is kind of a risque thing to do, to include her at the table, this woman in this way at the table. He uses linear perspective. We can see the room angling towards a vanishing point. We see out the windows, this evidence of landscape, the coffered ceiling that we found and learned about in the Roman times. The echoing and the arc of all these doorways and windows here. And the most important thing about this image that I want you to get down is that he is shown as accessible. Christ is shown as accessible, sitting at the table with us. That was a pretty radical idea. This idea of humanism, that we are, we are whole and complete beings. We are not having to make up for lost time with God. Da Vinci is literally putting Christ at the table with us. So here we have Michelangelo's David. This statue is giant, 17 feet tall. Has anyone seen this? It's up on a large pedestal. We talked about the transition from Greek statues to Roman statues. What did the Romans do with the Greek statues? What would they do with them? Copy them and melt them down. Yeah, copy them and melt them down. And we saw the evidence of that. If we saw a Greek copy or a Roman copy of a Greek statue, we would see this tree trunk. Michelangelo would have had no reason to put this tree trunk there except for it being an echo or nod to his study of Greek sculpture and Roman copies of Greek sculpture. What is the thing that's significantly out of proportion for this character here? Well, it looks strange. Yeah, his hands, they're huge. And that is, in this case, that is his tool. He is using his hands to kill Goliath. What's missing, thinking about Donatello's Goliath? What is not in this scene? The head, what else? And clothes, yeah. So here he is just, he's literally stripped down bare, this Hebrew shepherd boy, just with his slingshot slung over his shoulder. His giant hands, his slingshot. How old does this person look like he is? No longer 12, 13, but what? 20, yeah, 17, 18, 19, 20. Puberty has happened. We are on the other end of things here for this young person. You can see from that early Renaissance piece to this evolution here, that study of anatomy, thinking about the arm muscles, the way the muscle and bone is under the skin, the muscle and bone pushing out from the kneecap. We've come such a long way thinking back to Egyptian art and Sumerian art to this representation of human anatomy. Let's get this in your notes, please. This is the Sistine Chapel, also by Michelangelo. These Renaissance men doing these incredible unrelated things. We go from sculpture to painting to fresco painting. And I have a video I'll show you about the technique of this at the end of our lecture today. Fresco painting. And he was also an architect, and we're not going to look at any of his architecture just in the interest of time today. The Sistine Chapel, the walls here, they were painted by Raphael, who we won't be talking about. 
But the end panel and the ceiling were both painted by Michelangelo. This end panel, the last judgment scene, was painted about 30 years later than the ceiling. I'm going to zoom in here on the ceiling, but first I just want to look at this room itself. This room is 128 feet long. It's 44 feet wide, and the ceiling that we're zooming in on is 68 feet above the ground. He was painting in this technique of fresco. Fresco, where you put a small amount of plaster on the wall, you wait for it to set up to the right uh, tacking uh, ability to be paint, painted, and you paint on it, the pigments become a part of the wall. But it's messy and labor intensive, and you can only work in small sections at a time. Didn't they, didn't yeah. they cover up the... Yeah, on the end panel, they, there was a lot of penises, and they put, um, they painted fig leaves over all of the penises. Yep, yeah, that happened. So here we have scenes from the Old Testament. Please get that in your notes. So these are the scenes of the creation of man and woman, consequently. In the middle, we have God giving life to Adam, this image here. On the top, he is creating Eve for Adam. And on the bottom, he is separating the waters from heaven to give to earth. You can notice here that God is not coming out of clouds. He's not parting clouds in order to um, follow himself from heaven. He is inside of the human brain. So please make sure that is in your notes. So God is shown here and here inside the human brain. We know from writings that Michelangelo was, was taking cadavers out of graves, studying them. He took and, and drew extensive drawings and notes, but he destroyed them all. And probably because what he was doing was not legal, but he destroyed all of his evidence. And we see throughout the Sistine Chapel, there's several places where we have evidence of his study of anatomy painted in in secret. There's another place where there's the top of the spinal column, another place of what the inside of, or the outside of the brain looks like throughout the ceiling. So when we think about humanism, this idea that we are all perfect, God is not separate from us, this is a little bit of an FU from Michelangelo to the Catholic Church. Pope Julius asked him to paint this, asked him to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, and he really didn't want to do it. He hated painting. He wanted to be a sculptor and he wanted to be an architect. Painting was not his thing. So he fought the Pope, but it was the Pope, and the Pope said, you do what I say you do, and he did it. But his belief system, as you can imagine, was maybe a little different than the mainstream Catholic dogma. He placed God inside of the human brain. He placed God inside of us, rather than God being this thing that's separate from us. He was an atheist. Yeah. I love this letter he wrote to a friend. You can see on the left hand side here he is with his uh, his neck crinked up and this cartoon kind of garish bunny rabbit here. He's painting this bunny rabbit. And this is what he wrote. My haunches are grinding into my guts. My poor ass strains to work as a counterweight. Every gesture I make is blind and aimless. My skin hangs loose below me. My spine's all knotted from folding over itself. I'm bent taut as a Syrian bow. Because I'm stuck like this, my thoughts are crazy, perfidious tripe. Anyone shoots badly through a crooked blowpipe. He was not pleased with his post here, and it took him four years. He was up there on scaffolding for four years. that we can pluck out of space here. Yeah. Um, I see the there's a mirror on me on the back of the emergency cobble. Yeah. And when I get when I zoom when I zoom very in, it looks like there's 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 other two couple couple people there. Yeah, so we see the back of these two, and then we see a third person. In your research, who's that third person, potentially? Um, yeah. 
Probably like someone officiating the wedding that's going on. Yeah, and who do they suspect that might actually be? Yeah, a witness. Yeah, the, we actually believe that might be Jean Manac himself, that he's painted himself into this image. So what other things can we pluck out of space? What other objects are here? The dog. And when anybody did their research at the end, what did you find out about the dog? What's it represent? Yeah. He represents like faithfulness. Yeah, fidelity, loyalty. So we have a representation of what what's happening in this image. What's the event? A marriage. A marriage, yeah. Did anybody read about a left-handed marriage? Yeah, can you tell us about that? Um, so because it's like a left-handed marriage, it means like the woman has to like forfeit like all her usual, like all like, I forget like, exactly what said, but like all like the usual things that happen in marriage. It's like kind of... But um, why? Why is she a left-handed marriage? What was different about her? Yeah. They're not equal in status. Yes, good. They're not equal in status. So she would have been of lower status to him. Talk to me about her dress. Let's talk about her dress, yeah. Her dress looks, looks, looks big. Yeah, so initially right off the bat, when you did your formal elements analysis, what would you have said about her? That she was what? Pregnant. Pregnant, yeah. But then in your reading, then you would find out what they're showing. Yeah. There's like a, a component that says there's some weird like fashion statement, basically. A fashion, so having all that extra fabric, fashion statement for sure. But what is her pulling up of her dress indicating? Her willingness to what? <laughs> Become pregnant. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We are like the opposite of PC in this class because we have to. <laughs> so yes, yeah, she is willing to become pregnant. And not only is she lifting her dress up to tell us that, but they are literally making their marriage photo in the bedroom. OK. So what other objects are in this image? Yeah. Oranges. Oranges. And what are they a symbol of? Love. Yeah, good. And did anyone see, it's really impossible to see in the slide, what's out this, this window? Anybody think about that? There's a cherry tree outside the window. So you can you can actually see the berries on it. Yeah, hit John Manna. This man. Okay, um, chandelier. Who can talk to me about the chandelier? Steve, you can talk about the chandelier. You look so strong right now. <laughs> Anybody read about the chandelier? It has one candle burning, only one candle burning. And it's believed that was a symbol of the observation. Well, let me ask you this. We've been through the Middle Ages. What's missing from this image? What iconography is missing from this image? Religion. Religion, exactly, Religion's yeah. Intact. What's that? Religion is intact. In the sense of the marriage? No, but it's in the mirror. It is in the mirror with the Stations of the Cross, that is true. But it's also, this is potentially a symbol, another witness. We have a witness in the mirror, and it's interesting, the idea of witnessing through the mirror, and that being the Stations of the Cross. So here on this mirror, it's very hard to see unless you have a very high resolution image, where it's blown up quite a bit. But these are the stations of the cross. That's Christ coming to Calvary Hill, where he's uh, sacrificed or put to death there. Um, and then also the candle, the symbol for the observational God, the God that's kind of watching from above. Um, slippers. Anybody read about the slippers at all? Their shoes are off. They're in their home. We start, yeah. It reference um, like a line from the book of Exodus. That um, it's like I have it in here. There's something about um, like Tracy Lee's take the shoes off my feet. Put the shoes off my feet. So one of the other Jean Van X we started our semester with, do you remember the woman holding the baby in the church? And we went through that whole thing. Who was this woman? She was the Virgin Mary holding the baby. Do you guys remember that? The baby was naked, naked um, just wrapped in a little towel. So that idea, too, of being at home, being in undress, partially in undress, that's a theme moving through Jean Van Eyck's paintings. Um, 
What about them as characters? Can you say anything about them? Personality-wise? They're kind of really pH neutral, aren't they? Like, you can't tell if they're happy or sad, serious, or... His nose is big. His nose is big. His nose is big. His nose is big. Um, any other last thoughts on this image? Remember Gerard, another image we started this semester with that self-portrait by Gerard from 1500 who was holding his fur collar? Remember that? He was very frontal, had a Christ-like face to him. So think about the binary, the level of perfection that image 70 years later. So, you know, in the scheme of art history, along the same period of time. But when we look at this painting by John Van Eck, you know, when I zoomed in, you can see the chandelier, the pristine precision of that, the, the rug here in the background, the folds of her dress, the each individual hair on this dog. He was a master, master at detail. All right, that will be it for tonight for our lecture, but what we're going to do now, I need to have you do your survey if you haven't done it. So I'll give you, um, you know, however long you need, 10, 15 minutes. It's really important that you share your your reflection. So my boss is um, Can you have you from the middle, please? We have to do a you know what we find this week? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think I have to do it. I would say, I it as a general. I'm really bad at this. How do you figure out if you don't have any I just don't have an email at all. Okay, are you able to find it in Google? I think it's, does anybody know how to get to it? It doesn't even have a link. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it just says go to the middle. But like, well, that's kind of just really rude. I wonder if I need that link to get it. It's a better Does anyone know where the, is there a special link in Moodle? Uh, no, I got uh, reading the email. I don't know where to go. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Evaluation and survey.